You're listening to KRUD 106.3, and that was Time by Pink Floyd. Boy, that song brings back a lot of memories. I remember one time I was at D&D camp, and I... I apologize, but I need to make a correction. That last song was by The Alan Parsons Project, and not Pink Floyd. And here at 106.3 KRUD, we strive to play you the best rock and roll that's out there. And we also strive to get the artist and title right for everything we play. And so once again, I apologize. It shall not happen again. Next up, we have Sarah Smile by Hall & Oates. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to the Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your host, Rish Outfield and Big Anklevich. I want to live in Effington. And I die there too. That can be arranged. Hi everybody, welcome to the Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine. I'm Big Anklevich. And I'm Rich Outfield. Do we still say episode numbers? No, we haven't said episode numbers for a while, although we could if we wanted to. You know what episode this will be, right? This will be episode 153. Does it help people to hear the episode number? I don't know how it would, why it would matter. All right, well, uh, welcome back once again. This is, we're still on schedule. I think so, yeah. Unless something... Disastrous happens between now while we record and when we're supposed to put this out. Well, I, in, invariably something happens. I don't know about disastrous, but inconveniences happen. Like um, me having to sit here holding the baby because he will not stay asleep? We're still recording. Yeah, but that's still an inconvenience. Got to admit that. Yeah. Is this one of our uh, triple word score weeks or one of our... Off weeks. It's an on week. Today's story is another winner of our triple word score contest. The story is called Lazarus and the Tank, and it is by Michael Gray. Michael Gray? You want to tell people real quick what the triple word score contest is? Sure. It's a contest where people have to write a irritatingly short story. Less than 2,000 words. Based on the premise, a man comes into town. No. They have to incorporate three random words into their story, and we gave them the num- the numbers. We gave them the words which we pulled out of a hat. This is only the second one of these we've done, right? It is, yeah. The words for today's story, which I, I think they're a little bit more of a, a challenge, I think, than last time's words. These words, today's were students, paperclip, and porcupine. Hmm. So those are the three words that Michael Gray had to incorporate into an amazing science fiction tale. Wait, wait, wait. it had to be an amazing science fiction tale? Nobody no. told me that. No, I mean, I but... managed one anyway, but... Uh... <laughs> but no, that's just what Michael Gray wrote was an amazing science fiction tale. I actually purposefully tried not to write science fiction for mine because that's what I always write. So I tried to do, well, that's probably not true. I wanted to do something different, so I specifically tried not to write the same kind of story as I usually do. But it's not my story today. Today it's Michael Gray's story, Lazarus in the Tank. And the story was produced by Tom Tancredi, who was a longtime listener of the show and a big supporter and now... He has decided to try his hand at uh, producing a story. This was his first. This was his very first try at it. Uh, I think we're going to get a lot of those with the Triple Word Score contest. We've got a lot of people who volunteered to try this out with uh, this contest. And it was perfect for it because they're all short. So it gives people a chance to get their feet wet without getting the rest of themselves wet. All the way up above where you can breathe. Okay. (laughs) And now a word about the author. Michael Gray was born and grew up in Yorkshire and now lives in Melbourne with his wife and two boys. His work has been featured, among others, 
in the Andromeda Spaceways In-Flight magazine, the Australian Literature Review, and the Journey Into podcast, which was shortlisted for a 2013 Parsec Award. He also mentions he's not bitter about who that Parsec went to. He is currently taking applications for the role of Writer's Cat. Candidates can contact him at www.michaelgray.com.au or on Twitter at MikeS005. All right, so uh, I guess that's that. Uh, we'll go on to the story. Enjoy. Lazarus in the Tank by Michael Gray Rain drummed his forehead, cold and long enough that each drop felt like falling lead. This was the, what, third day of rain? Second? Time had ceased to hold any context. It had rained long enough the forest floor was sodden, and the cold managed to emanate up from the mud as well as down from the gray sky. Lazarus looked on the positives. The constant slap of drops on fern leaves masked his movement or would do so when he came to move. There were no dry twigs to snap underfoot, and he did not have to regulate his body temperature to disguise it from heat sensors. The atmosphere had done that for him. He then weighed the one immense negative. The tank was still there. It sat in the clearing, anti-grav disengaged and lowered to the ground as if it were nothing more than a rock. Rain ran in rivulets down its molded sides. Every so often, a small bird would land on its snub cannon, call a mournful cry to echo among the damp trees, then take flight again. It looked like it was dead, but he knew otherwise. It knew he was there, just not where. Either it had been a trap or a monumental drop in intelligence but the tank had been here waiting for their insertion. It had annihilated the rest of his team while they could do nothing but run. It had been quick, loud, and wet, and in the end, it had just been him, laying beneath dripping ferns. The tank knew it had missed one target, and it knew he would have to come this way to leave the forest. So it had powered down and waited while he lay in the shadows, drinking rainwater, and thought on the individual merits of eventual hypothermia versus starvation. No, no, no! The klaxon and flashing lights signaled the exercise was over. Around Lazarus and his team, the simulation shell's artificial walls were lifted up to the ceiling, revealing the actual area the exercise had been set in was surprisingly small. Drill Sergeant Novalesk strode over the now bare floor. No, you! He pointed at Helks. You're dead. You! He jabbed a finger at Bertoli. You're dead. You, you, you! Wagner, Spinks, Virginian. Dead, dead, dead. And you... He turned on Lazarus, shoved a finger into his chest hard enough to rock him back. You killed them all. The exercise was a fix. The words were out of Lazarus's mouth before he could stop them, catching Sergeant Novalesk as he was turning away. The sergeant stopped, turned back. When he spoke next, the volume had gone, replaced with a quiet menace. What was that, boy? Lazarus's mistake was obvious, but pride would not allow him to stop. The exercise was crap. There was no way we could have won. Novalesk's forehead nodded. The punch caught Lazarus in the crook between cheekbone and nose in a wet crunch. He fell, blinded with tears and bloody snot. Anyone share Lazarus's opinion? Novalesk stalked between the team, arms crossed at his lower back. Staring at each in turn. No, no sir. sir. So how would you beat it? Wagner? Wagner thought. Blinked. Hold position. Request backup with EMP grenades to negate their force field, sir. 
Backup is not an option, Wagner, you know that. An extra 20 minutes PT. Spinks? Sir, force fields are impenetrable to our weapons. We hold position and negotiate their surrender. If the Council Protection Agency wanted separatist surrender, they wouldn't be training agents now, would they? Forty minutes extra PT. Helks? Sir, we... Helks thought. I... I... Don't know, sir. The test, Sergeant, was crap. Lazarus had pushed himself up, pressed his fingers to his nose, and felt two pieces of cartilage grind together. Definitely broken. Again. We were unequipped to counter force fields and were outmatched. The test was designed to see how well we'd die. Novalesk was in his face again. Is that what you think, Lazarus? That the CPA would invest in your sorry arse just to throw it away? There is always a way, boy. And if you can't learn that, I will kill you myself. <laughs> Lazarus dragged himself through the mud. The smell of slow rot and leaf mold edged the cold air and made his nose twitch. A sneeze threatened, and he had to bury his face in wet mulch before it could escape. The tank was less than 50 meters away, and anything out of place would trip its sensors and invite a terminal volley of high-caliber rounds. He pulled his face free and looked between the fronds. It sat there as still as ever. He pulled himself on. Slowly, slowly he traversed the underwood, making a circle around the tank over a course of six hours. Frozen muscles threatened to cramp at every movement, draining what energy he had left. He reached forward and grabbed a black root, and nearly cried out when he pulled a hand toward his own face. It was Helk's arm, the only one of that coloring in their squad, and still inside the sleeve of his fatigues. It ended at the elbow, with a wound washed clean by rain. Beyond it was Helk's silenced carbine. Lazarus pulled himself over to it and quietly checked it. He'd lost his own when he had been thrown through the trees in the initial bombardment and should have felt happier to be armed again. But he looked between it and the tank and could have laughed. He would have more hope of using it to beat the thing to death than hoping the rifle could penetrate the armor. Any chance of humor stopped when he saw what the tank faced. It sat opposite the opening from the clearing. South and out of the forest, his only means of escape. A ravine barely more than a path between two sheer cliffs and only approachable across clear ground. What vegetation grew around it had been burned clear, and now he would have to walk out in front of the tank to leave the forest. He looked once more at the carbine, and then at the tank. Lazarus was back in the training shell, now fitted to be a standard template reactor control center. Inside it was just him and Drill Sergeant Novalesk. And Novalesk was unequipped. The exercise was officially called Solo Operative Locate and Terminate, or SALT, as the acronym went. However, the students had come to know it as Spy versus Spy. Right now, Lazarus was locating his instructor, and he looked forward to the termination. They were 30 minutes in with no contact. Lazarus had called on every gram of his training. He infiltrated silently, moved like a ghost. Each sector had been penetrated, swept, and exited as if nothing had happened. He may as well not be there. So far, the same could be said of Novalesk, but he couldn't hide for long. Lazarus approached a door. His augments told him that the next room was administration. No hardware. The layout and inventory agreed with the intel. His hand hovered a fraction over the handle. No electromagnetic signatures. He gripped it and twisted. 
the door did not so much open as rock it backwards. It struck his face with enough force to crack wood. Training and enhanced reflexes took over. He tried to release the handle and roll backwards with the inertia, but the door just came on, free from the wall, flattening him with unexpected weight. He landed on his back, skidding across the floor as velocity spent its remaining energy. And he stopped. He lay stunned, tried to make sense of what happened, and roll away. He couldn't move. The door was up to his neck. He should have been able to just flip it off, but something weighed it down. The darkness coalesced into a figure, and Drill Sergeant Novales came walking down the door's length, each boot fall pushing the breath from Lazarus's lungs. Novales reached the door's end, knelt on one knee, and tapped a fingertip on Lazarus's forehead. Tag. You're it. Lazarus refused to see the humor. How? He wheezed trying to roll the door from his chest. It's amazing what you can do with the propellant in a fire extinguisher. Novalesk jumped off and pulled Lazarus up. The door had been reinforced with several desktops, until Lazarus guessed it weighed more than him. Four fire extinguishers had been jury-rigged to each corner and linked by a wire to the handle. You're officially dead. Better luck next time. Novales handed Lazarus his rifle. He hadn't even realized he'd dropped it. Thank you, sir. He stared at the door like it personally insulted him. Your problem is you beat yourself up too much. Want to make things more difficult. You don't get medals for that, boy. Just for doing your job. Make use of what's around you, not just what you're given. The drill sergeant held out a big hand and slowly closed it into a fist. Squeeze the world and drip its pulp into a shape that suits you. Lazarus laughed. <laughs> Something funny, boy? Easy as that, sir? Novalesk nodded. Easy as that. Lazarus prodded the door with his boot. Desktops, door, fire extinguisher, everything matched the inventory. Would you look at that? Easy enough when you're among something you can use, sir. An agent learns to use everything. He laughed again. <laughs> everything, huh? And what would an agent do with a... He thought. Paper clip and a porcupine. Well, boy, at least he could make a very inconvenienced porcupine. Lazarus rolled onto his stomach. The rain had still not let up. All to the good. If it had been drier, Helk's carbine could have started a forest fire and done the tank's job for it. It was time. He pulled the twine. The other end tugged the trigger on Helk's rifle, 40 meters away, and it fired a chatter of rounds blindly into the trees. There was barely a delay. The tank's turret rose, swung, aimed, fired. The spot where the carbine lay propped against a log bloomed incandescent and a fireball rose into the air. Even in the perpetual damp, a few trees caught and belched dark smoke. The tank made an internal whirring sound and rose from the ground, shaking free bracken and twigs. Its body twisted in the direction it just fired, while its turret remained locked, waiting for something to dare come through the maelstrom it had unleashed. And then it moved forward. From his position, Lazarus looked up to the canopy. A series of logs, fixed with stakes and weighted with enough boulders to crack a bunker, hung above the trench which lay in the tank's path. He had learned. He had reached out and squeezed the world. And the tank would be his porcupine. All right, everybody. Hope you enjoyed the story. We're back. And uh, as our special deal with the uh, triple word score stories, we don't do the normal author's note. Instead, Rish Outfield whipped up a triple word score of 
questions. Three questions. That Not you must... a score of questions. <laughs> yeah, that could be bad. Be here all day. No, it's well, it's almost a score of questions because I think each question has about six parts, except for the last one. That's a, that's a pretty straightforward one. But anyways, we asked uh, these questions of Michael Gray. And uh, we'll go ahead and let Rish Outfield ask those questions, and I will play the part of Michael Gray. Okay. Uh, do you want to do it with an Australian accent, just for fun? Uh, Don't you dare. I can try to do an Australian accent. I'll do my best. It's You've heard my Australian accent before, so it's pretty sad. But Question one. Was this a fun contest for you? Is writing generally fun to do anyway? How did the rules of this contest make it more or less enjoyable for you? Let me say, first of all, that that's not just one question. I was at least three. Secondly... Terrible. <laughs> Michael Gray has this to say. It was a fun contest. I find all forms of creative writing fun. <laughs> Are you sure this is a good idea? No. <laughs> Most of my stories come from the free flow of conscious, where the only limitation is my imagination. Themed submission calls offer something of a challenge, or a target to aim for. But the triple word score contests was a particular challenge I could not let go unanswered. I'm so glad I entered. I had a tremendous time writing Lazarus, and the tank. Either... I'm making the baby cry with that accent. <laughs> now, do you think the child is crying because it's such an ugly accent or because he's aware that it's not a good Australian accent? <laughs> I'm not sure. Maybe a little of both. Uh, you were given three words at random. How much impact did the three words have on the finished product? How did you decide in what way to use the words? The three words I was given, students, Bing. paperclip, and porcupine, basically made the story. Without them, I don't think I would have ever written it. When I received them, I stared at a blank document for about 15 minutes waiting for something to occur. I think I've got a lot of, like, Cockney British in that, which is not good. I think Big is right. Win, that's how they say the E, when it didn't, I sat back in exasperation and fixated on the paperclip. Well, I bet MacGyver could do something with that at least. I thought, and the moment I did, the story was just there in my head. Pretty much, word for word, the finished product. I wish all writing was that easy. <laughs> Question number three. Olivia Newton-John... Overrated or a good Sheila? <laughs> She's a good Sheila and not at all stuck up. Huh. And uh, who is your favorite doctor? Sylvester McCoy. He wasn't the doctor when I first saw Doctor Who. That was Peter Davidson. But he was the doctor when I was old enough to take notice. Just the right age to have the mindless terror of the Cybermen instilled in me. Pitiful. Why did you make me do that? I didn't. I tried to stop you. When? I... You should have stopped me. That was a bad idea. Well, let's let Announcer Man be the judge of that. What do you think, Announcer Man? Was How was that accent? Well, that sure sucked. Even for you. Yeah, this sucked more than a Hoover vacuum cleaner on chore day. That's right. Uh, for once, I'm really agreeing with announcer man here. And that really is saying something. <clears throat> Anyways, yeah, sorry about that, Mike. I probably should never have done that. And from what I remember, you're a British guy anyways that moved to Australia. Isn't that the case? So maybe I shouldn't have done that accent to begin with. Well, but maybe that's how Aussies sound to him, to Michael. Yeah, maybe. Maybe my accent is exactly his because it's like a British crossed with Australian in a really bad... No, probably not, huh? <laughs> I don't know what accent that was, but I think we've had this conversation before. I don't know how Australians actually talk. Yeah, it's, it's a hard when one. I imitate them. They're like, we don't talk like... No, they go, we don't talk like that. 
And I'll be like, what? Now you sound like you're from Minnesota. Are you, are you sure you're from Australia? And he's like, I'm from Brisbane. And I'm like, really? I, see, I thought Ozzy said Brisbane. No. Good day. I'd be like, all right. Okay. Well, I guess I just, I, I have a tin ear for the Ozzy accent. I'm sorry. Yeah. It's a hard one. Definitely. I think that's what she said. Well, thank you, announcer man. <laughs> he, once you get him started, he... Yeah, I guess. That's what she said. Well, that one wasn't quite as good as the first. That's what... Okay, all right. <laughs> yeah, I, I once said on these very airwaves that that joke never gets old. I think I may have to amend that. Yeah, it does get there eventually. So, today's story, Lazarus in the Tank, with paperclip, <laughs> porcupine... And students. You do realize I have to put the sound in every time you say those, right? I, I mean... Every time I say paperclip, oh. porcupine, and students? I don't do it for fun. It's a it's an OCD thing. Now, please. Really? So I shouldn't say paperclip, please. porcupine, and students again? I would ask you not to do that, yes. <laughs> now, you said that this was a hard, these were harder words than the last one. I don't know. He... he kind of figured a way around it. I mean, there was no porcupine in the story, really. But he had a metaphorical porcupine, I guess you could say. He used porcupine to mean something else, which was clever, which was a good way to uh, work it in. And the paperclip thing as well. Yeah, I mean... Students was the other. Students was... Yes, that is. You gotta go to bed, man. Students was the easier one of the uh, three of them, I would think. Because, you know, you can say somebody's a student or that there are students pretty easily to describe some people and then move on. Students gives you a setting, but I don't know where he got this setting and this scenario from those three words. I mean, in his author's note, he acts as though just connecting the dots gave him this scenario. But I don't know. I mean, like, okay, yours... Your three words, which, you know, we won't talk about yet, it's easy to see where you went from those three words. And my three words were rutabaga, rape victim, and colostomy bag. And I think that kind of puts a visual image in your head, too. But this one, he got military, he got war games, sci-fi war games. I I don't know where that came from. Yeah. It is, if, if All this... from the word students, basically, because paperclip and porcupine were, they were just kind of uh, used in the dialogue, really. Uh, you know, MacGyver didn't actually use a paperclip to discommode a porcupine. Mm. <laughs> it's interesting where it, where it went and how he got there. It's definitely not what you would expect from the three words, for sure. But um, also, as he said in his author's note... Uh, he would never have written this story otherwise. So somehow he bounced these, or these words, his brain digested, if you will, these three words in a very unique way, uh, in a way that it wouldn't have worked for me or, or not fair to say, anybody else. But, uh, you know, that was part of the randomness of the game, of the contest. There are some people probably who lost the contest because they were given words that they didn't know what to do with or words that inspired you know a story that would have won had been they they've been given another group of words and so if we ever do this again it my guess is we won't have the same winners but who knows i mean there are, there are, there are probably people out there that you give them any three random words and they'll be able to make something of it because their minds work that way or they're they're really good storytellers or or they're really creative or they they slipped their muse an extra five bucks. I don't I don't know how creativity works really. Uh huh. I know there was a lot of people who signed up to do the contest, but then never actually turned in a story in the end, because I am assuming because they got their words and they went ah uh, yeah, a guy uh, does no uh, I don't know. Oh, crap, it's due tomorrow now. Uh, okay, forget it. It took me a long... And it seems like that's one of those things that common. I think Jennifer Gifford talked about that in last week's... Or last time story, I should say, because it wasn't the last one. But uh, she talked about how, you know, she got the words and she was just like, bah. 
and sat there and pondered and pondered on them for a while before she ever finally got to an, a story idea. And I know that I did the same thing. I sat there and I had the words and the words seemed like they could lend themselves really easily towards a certain kind of a story. And yeah, I thought, I don't want to do the obvious story. And so I pondered and I pondered and I tried to figure a different way out of them. I guess kind of similar to what I did with the Broken Mirror story where, you know, it had a certain easy way out that I didn't want to do. And so I pondered and pondered until I came up with something else that earned me a one. But uh, <laughs> still, <laughs> but that seems like that's, you know, most people, especially since there's really short stories, too. I think people didn't struggle so much to write them. They struggled mostly just to come up with something. Because it's hard to come up with something to go with the three words that you get, it seems. I don't know. I, everybody writes differently. Usually with me on these contests, at least all the ones we've done on the Steve, I will write down several possibilities. And, you know, in some contests in the past, I've, I've entered several times and always lost. But you know, something that we reiterate over and over again, I mean, over 150 episodes, nobody writes the exact same way. And there are no hard and fast rules for how to write. It's just something that you have to teach yourself. Uh, and then the way that you teach yourself is different than the way someone else teaches themselves. And so, yeah, it may be that if we had done it differently, if we let's say that the triple word score story was everybody can enter... And here are your three words. And they, everybody had the same three words. That might have been fun, too. I mean, it's much closer to a broken mirror story. Right. In that case. But uh, that would have been interesting to see, you know, how many of the stories that took the three words were similar. In the past, with the broken mirror stories, it was always shocking to me that they were so different. Yeah, that um, always kind of shocked me, too. We had one little here's where it starts kind of a thing. And you went with that. But yeah, every single writer is a different person. And the stories were all as varied as the people that, that wrote them, I guess you could say. Everybody has different experiences in their past to draw on. And uh, yeah, they just each went their own way with it. And I think at some point we even were talking about that. Just how, you know, we've talked about how there's this, the ideas... It seems to be like it's in the... Maybe all the muses have the same idea, but you're always having the same movie come out, but done by different people. You know, you have the Asteroid Hits the Earth movie, which is always the, the easiest example when you had Deep Impact and Armageddon that came out the same summer, but they were... I mean, it was the same general idea, but they were vastly different movies, really. And it happens again and again and again, where we have a movie that has the same premise. You know, the guy somehow slips his own sperm into the artificial insemination. There's two movies on that. And they're different movies. And it happens again and again. And we even talked about that. If you have an idea for something, and then you see that somebody else has written something similar to it, you know, don't give up on the idea. You don't need to give up on it, because you're, when you write your idea, it's going to be so different from the other people's you know, that it will be its its own thing. And, you know, you don't need to worry about whether people think, oh, yeah, he stole that idea from whoever. Because everybody can come up with, oh, yeah, this is like Pretty Woman meets Jumanji on an aircraft carrier or whatever. I wonder if people who aren't writers are interested or if their eyes just glaze over when we start talking about writing. For me, it's, it's such a, a, a secretive, mysterious process you know what i mean when you hear somebody talk about how they came up with something or how they mentally connected the dots and it it almost seems like a spell that was cast and sometimes the spell works and sometimes the spell misfires but you don't know until you cast it what's going to happen it, and i wonder am i unique in thinking that, that writing is that mysterious and exciting uh yeah i don't know i wonder if the listeners that aren't writers think do they think of it like when you listen to the director's commentary on a film where you're like, oh, wow, and this is what they... I remember I listened to the director's commentary of Monty Python's flying... Or, sorry, Monty Python's uh, Search for the Holy Grail, and 
I was just blown away by some of the stuff that they said. You know, they just talked about how they made armor, for example, and they just took a certain cloth and painted it silver, and now suddenly it looked like chain mail. And I thought, oh my gosh, that's so rad. I want to make a night movie and do that myself. I wonder if, if people think of it like that or if they're more just like, they're talking about this again, okay, fast forward, who knows. But yeah, I think it's kind of that way too. I've heard some people say, you know, though, that once you're a good enough writer, it doesn't matter what your idea is, you'll make it a good story. Hmm. Do you think that's possible? Or, you know, you talk about how it's like a spell that you were cast and sometimes it works and other times it fizzles. Do you become a good enough wizard ever that the spell always is cast correctly? Or some I, ideas just aren't interesting? I, yeah, I got to go with some ideas aren't interesting. I mean, I, like the, the writer I've read the most of, obviously, is Stephen King. And he has such a, a mastery of the English language that, you know, he, he can wax rhapsodic about any subject. And it's, it's poetry. And he just, you know, it's, it's so great to listen to. And yet a lot of his, his stories just don't work or his novels are just like, wow, that didn't do anything. But the writing was really, really solid, really, really listenable or readable. But yeah, he, I mean, he's written some stinkers over the last decade or so or two. Like his short stories, maybe his craft has improved since then. But the inspiration well probably isn't what it used it's to be. running dry. I don't, I, I don't know. I mean, that's not fair. I guess if I were sitting with him and, and I said that that would be insulting and I didn't mean to be I, I meant it to be a backhanded compliment but <laughs> you know I, I, I don't know I, I have a certain level of ability and yet I sometimes surprise myself that oh hey this story turned out really well and oh this story didn't I, I, I thought that the premise was really really promising but I, yeah, yeah that's, that is interesting I think Probably when you get to a certain level of expertise, if the premise is really solid, it'll probably be a solid story. And other times you think the premise is solid, but it's not really all that solid and it's going to turn out a little dull. And I know that sometimes I realize that the premise is probably not as good. Like I'm running a story right now in fits and starts that uh, I think the premise is so-so, sadly, but I'm writing it anyways. And it'll probably wind up being a so-so story because of that. I don't think that... I, I'm sure that I'm definitely not one of those writers that can elevate it above being so-so just purely through my craft or whatever. I know that that is not the case. Um, maybe there will come a day. And I know that some writers can do well enough that it's interesting to read even though the story is not a blow-you-away kind of story. And when you're done, you're just like... Meh, that was all right. But you read it all the way through and you read it at a normal, you know, good speed. You didn't like put it down and then be like, eh, I can leave it there for several weeks and then finally pick it back up to finish it. I wonder how much <laughs> in these triple word score episodes we're going to talk about writing and how much people will want to shoot themselves. Gosh, I don't know. I feel I feel bad if somebody hates that subject because it's going to come up. I'd say every other episode, if not more frequently. Well, on some of these, the fun is how did they come to this conclusion from the three words that they were given. I mean, it's, it's, it's all about the writing process and, and whether there's inspiration or perspiration involved. And uh, we could talk about something else. We could talk about the, uh, the stereotypical hard-ass military commander, the sergeant. Uh-huh. Uh, you know, I, I wondered, well, why are the why are the drill sergeants so hard on these you know young Marines or these these you know army privates or whatever? And and my uncle, who was in the military, said, uh, well, the the point of that is to give all of the recruits something to focus on. They they feel like it's an us versus him mentality, and we're going to band together as a unit focusing our hatred and our ire on this one man that's why he's he's so brutal and such you know he's 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 the enemy instead of a teacher or a, a confidant or, or you know some kind of role model or or whatever it is and then he's like 
but some of them are just sadistic evil bastards. <laughs> I was like, oh, oh, okay. Yeah, I've heard that same thing, that that's why they do it, to get the uh, unit to unite. Ooh, unit and unite. Those are almost the same word. But yeah, it gets them to come together as a as a group. Which is that, I guess when people get trained, do they stay together as a group? Or do they get sent off all to their own places after they've done their training? Do you know how that works? I don't know. Well, it, it depends. I mean, if you're, there are specialties and all that. Because boot camp or basic training or whatever is just going to be all the people that got there at the same time. Right. But I would imagine that a lot of the people that you went through basic with would be shipped out at the same time because and you would wind up it's, it's, it's 186 set, or whatever together right it's a set amount of time that you're going to go through basic training and if you all got there the same day then i mean unless something weird happened you would all ship out the same day i we're in peacetime quote unquote right now so so it may be more lax or more uh, you know i don't know it, it maybe it's more like a school sometimes and there's two or three privates that just, you know, hey, they're not ready. And so they get two weeks extra than everybody else does. Do you, do you know, do you of your many, many, many brothers and sisters, none of them were in the military? <laughs> they were all in the military, pretty much. But I don't know anything about it, sadly. I don't know how it is that I don't know that. My father worked in the military for years and continued on with the National Guard even after he stopped working with the military full time. And my one, two, three of my brothers have been in the National Guard as well. And several of them work full time with the National Guard. I don't know how I don't know this stuff. I totally should, but I don't. I'm asking you for information when I have all these family members that should have told me this already. I'm sure our listeners right now are typing up their response on the comments, which would be good because... Uh, uh, us clueless ones don't know, and I, I think we've probably got at least a few listeners that have military experience. So that would be cool if you could help us to understand exactly how the, the thing works. Because well, it, it makes me wonder, if they get these guys to unite, and then when they get to the end of their training, now it's like, okay, you're going to the 186th, you're going to the 34th, you're going to the 26th. And it's like, what good was the unification now that you just pulled them to pieces and sent them away into different units. So it seems like they should all go to the same place, but I don't know. I, what I wonder is, if you have a military background, do you enjoy this sort of thing more or less than somebody who didn't? If you were in Vietnam, do you love to watch Platoon and Full Metal Jacket and Casualties of War and, and Forrest Gump and Inglorious Bastards? You know, all those movies, those Vietnam movies... Or do you say, wow, I don't want to see anything like that. You know, too close to home, too much. You know, it brings back too many bad memories. Or, I, you know, every single thing they get wrong bugs the crap out of me. <laughs> yeah, um, it, it seems like that could be definitely possible. I know you've always asked me that about movies and TV shows set in the news. And, and often, yeah, they, they just bug me when I see them. And I'm just like, oh, come on. You know, when they do stuff like that. And somebody, and I can't remember who it was, was complaining about some show that they watched where it was yeah set in the, their profession you know every little thing that they did they're just like uh all right that's it turn it off i can't take it anymore so there's obviously that risk that you run yeah that that's the funny thing about a, a being in the military is you ha you run a double gauntlet i guess it is because a it could be too close to home or b it's not right <laughs> If it's too right, then they're just like, oh, I can't take it. It's too, it's bringing back all the bad memories. And then, and then if it's, if it's not right enough, they're just like, oh, it's totally wrong. Nothing's right with this. I can't watch it. Seems like you have a really hard time making a military movie that will please military guys. I don't know. Yeah, well, you can always go the sci-fi route. Um, hopefully somebody who was in the military will be able to take a step back. When it's a show like Ender's Game or Aliens or Starship Troopers or Smurfs 2, you know, one of those. Lazarus in the Tank. Right, Lazarus in the Tank. You know, it's distant enough that even if, if it doesn't jibe with how your military experience was, you, you have that out in the back of your mind of, well, this is 100 years from now, things have changed. Or, you know, I, I don't know. Maybe not. 
maybe the human mind, because of solipsism, is going to be able to say, this is what rings accurate to my experience and all the rest doesn't matter. Solipsism, huh? I don't know. I mean, I, I, I'm certainly solipsistic and if a story doesn't speak to me, I don't want it. I don't think, well, it could speak to somebody else. All right. Well, uh, I think we've uh, spoken our piece on this uh, particular story. And so we're going to go ahead and, uh, and call this an episode. Yeah, uh, please continue to talk about it in the forums if you'd like. I, I, if you have a military background, I'd like to know what your thoughts are. And, and if the, the drill sergeant if that totally reminded you of somebody that you served with or if you're just like oh thank goodness my guy was he put his arm around you and said you were number one kind of guy and, and are there drill sergeants like that <laughs> i don't know he's there like you certainly here, here, let me do an impression of that drill sergeant every single one of you is important and individual and i pray for each one of you before i go to sleep each night the first thing I do when I wake up the next morning is look forward to seeing your smiling faces. <laughs> I love each and every one of you. Yeah, there certainly isn't any of those guys on TV or in the movies. Never seen one. It's like, I know you finished last in the obstacle course, but it doesn't matter because you are special. You are a unique and beautiful snowflake. <laughs> <laughs> That, that is kind of funny just to imagine. <laughs> so maybe uh, it makes sense that they're always the other way around. All right. Uh, thanks for listening, everybody. Oh, hey, hey. Thank you, Michael, for entering the contest. Thank you, Tom Tancredi, for producing this story. If anybody is donating to the show, thank you for doing that. There was one thing that I, we vowed in our drive that we were going to do other than ask for donations. What is it? I don't know. Tell people we are on Twitter as at Steve, and you can, can be friends with us on Facebook if you're not already. We uh, post stuff about the show. You can also check out the forums. Go to the forums. I think we've already said that. So we'll just say it again. Yeah. And you can donate. Did we say that? Uh, we were just about to say that, 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 that you can donate. What we would really appreciate when it comes down to it is if you have uh, daughters or uh, attractive <laughs> nieces oh no, no you what were you going to I say? was gonna say subscriptions as opposed to just the one-time thing a subscription there's several ways you can subscribe to donate to the show where you donate five dollars a month or five dollars a quarter which is every three months that is really good because it's a constant you know it's a, it's a something we can rely on uh, we can expect that to be there so that we can have that there uh, always. Um, so that's something we're going to try and push. I think we may have mentioned that, and you know, that gets my goat, that we're going to push to get more subscriptions. We may even have a subscription drive to come up at some point. But anyways, yeah, if, if, you know, feel free to subscribe. That would be cool. And now a word from our sponsor. Hello, I am C-3PO, Human Cyborg Relations here with my counterpart, R2-D2. Because I am translating, R2, how else will they understand what you say? Oh, run a self-diagnostic, why don't you? We are here today to talk about the Star Wars Delusions of Grandeur podcast, a show named after a line I spoke in The Empire Strikes Back. I am aware Captain Solo also said it, but I am quite sure we are more beloved characters than he is. Anyway, it is a conversation show centering around Star Wars topics, which should be quite informative and entertaining, if it survives the unfreezing process, that is. <coughs> all right, perhaps it is not so much informative as lively and opinionated, as all good podcasts should be. You can find the show over at www.delusionsofgrandeurpodcast.blogspot.com. <coughs> I'm just getting to that, Artu. Join hosts Marshall Latham of the Journey Into podcast and from the Dune Steef audio fiction magazine, Rish... Rish Outfield? Oh, no! Artu, we're playing the wrong promo! Oh, hey, thank you, announcer man, for running that. 
that's a, a podcast that uh, Marshall Latham and I do uh, about Star Wars, as you know. And you have been a guest on the show, so you know. Uh, and speaking of which, if you want to go over to Journey Into, Marshall's podcast, we're on that podcast. Uh, we did um, The Gold Bug by Edgar Allan Poe. And then uh, we stuck around and talked to Marshall about how difficult it was not to say the N-word uh, in that one. And so uh, if you want to go over there and listen to us slog our way through an immense Edgar Allan Poe story, uh, I, I recommend it. Yeah, it was a time. Can't say that it was a good time, but it was a time. Um, <laughs> and, and we thank you for yours. Yes, we thank you for your time. Thanks for listening, everybody. And thanks for suffering through our spiel of announcements here at the end. Have a good week, and we'll see you next time. Your mountain is waiting. So get on your way. Thank you for listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. The Dune Steve is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. So you can share the show with whomever you'd like, but you cannot charge for it or alter the show. Take two. Okay, there you go. That was fabulous. And in the end, it had just been him, laying beneath dripping ferns. <coughs> the tank was less than 50 meters away, and anything out of place would trip its sensors and invite a terminal volley of high-caliber rounds. He pulled his face free and looked between the fronds. With fronds like these, who needs an enemies? <coughs> Frozen muscles threatened to... <coughs> Ew. Yeah, that's what they threatened to do, so there. No, no, cramp, not... <laughs> Frozen muscles threatened to cramp at every movement. He landed on his back, skidding across the floor as velocity spent its remaining energy. And he stopped. Do you want to make the sound of the door hitting you in the face and your body hitting the ground? Okay. Oh, God. <clears throat> Too girly, I think, for a, uh, a soldier. Less girly? Mm. Is it really Tig? I'm going to say Tag. Okay. I can only assume that that is a typo. Right. Tig, you're it. I, I was going to say it because it's sci-fi. I thought maybe they say Tig in the future. Well, it's it's written by an Australian, so maybe they say Tig in Australia. Tig, you're it. You're it, Tig. T, right, you're it, right. So you're saying I should say Tig and Tag or just... <laughs> no, just say it. Tag. Okay. Well, boy, at least he could make a very inconvenienced porcupine. What was he doing with that paper clip? To the poor porcupine. He used it on his wang. Lazarus rolled onto his stu- Oh, sorry. <clears throat> Back into announcer mode. <clears throat> I am Batman. I'm Batman. Where's the detonator? You wouldn't have given it to a regular citizen. Where is it? I'm Batman. Lazarus rolled onto his stomach. He had learned. He had reached out and squeezed the world. And the tank would be his porcupine. Very inconvenienced by that paperclip. On its wang. Okay. Uh, do you want to do it with an Australian accent, just for fun? Uh, I can try. I don't think Michael Gray's Australian, but... Oh, I'm, I'm fairly sure he is. You think so? Yeah. You think he's Mike's... Oh, I don't know. I just, on that submission... It had his address, and it was in he was in Melbourne or Brisbane or someplace like that. So, but it had a picture of him holding an English flag, and wearing an O2 jersey. Well, maybe he lived, he he moved from England to Australia. If he's Mike's, then he did.
That was the guy. You remember when I s- thought that Gino was from England originally? Mm-hmm. I had confused him with Michael Gray. Except for that it sounded like he had been in that position for days. Can you imagine? You know, he was worrying about starving, freezing to death, or starving. Mm-hmm. And uh, yikes, can you imagine how uncomfortable and unpleasant and how bad you would smell? And yeah, uh, The only warmth you would get is from urinating or defecating in your, <laughs> in your, own in your pants. pants. Is this really what you guys want to be talking about tonight? <sighs> okay. Yes? Do you want to do a podcast? Do you want to do a show? That better not be you, Big. Do you want to do a podcast? It could open many doors. And by the time it ends, we'll make loads of friends. Not to mention all the whores. F*** off! Okay, bye.